All right, I got 215. Are we good on the video? Do you need to like jump start anything or can I just start? All right. So, hi, welcome to Jason Web Tokens Will Improve Your Life. I'm John. Uh, I go by Gene Hack most places online. So, if you see me on Twitter or GitHub or whatever, it's probably Gene Hack, not John. Um, in my day job, I am the vice president for technology of an internet based IT consultancy firm called Infinity Interactive. We solve problems with technology. Um, <laughs> and this is my dog, Sammy. <laughs> Sammy has a Twitter account too. She's Sammy Jean Heck. Um, now that I've been promoted into a management position, I used to be a developer. Well, I was a sysadmin and then I was a developer and then I got promoted into management for my sense. So I don't get to do that much coding anymore. And when I do end up doing a coding project, Sammy helps me from her little office underneath my desk. So this talk is about JSON Web Tokens or JOTs, JWTs. So what is a JSON Web Token? Who's heard of JSON Web Tokens before this talk? So uh, maybe half the room. Who's using JSON Web Tokens? Maybe three or four people. Okay, cool, awesome. Um, who wants to be using JSON Web Tokens? All right, maybe half the room, awesome. So if you don't know what a JSON Web Token is, you might punch that into your Googler, and you would probably end up at JWT.io, where you would learn that JSON Web Tokens are an open industry standard RFC 7519 method for rep representing claims securely between two parties. <laughs> Sammy uh, is actually has a, a disability. She suffers from resting stoned face. <laughs> um, so, at that point, you might, if you are an intrepid individual like myself, go on the web and look up RFC 7519, which is called JSON Web Token, or JWT. And in 7519, you will learn that the official pronunciation for JWT is JOT. So I will periodically be saying JOT during this talk, and I mean JSON Web Tokens. But as you read through 7519, first you will become confused, and then eventually you'll become enlightened because you'll realize it's not just 7519 that you need to know about. There's also 7515, 16, 17, 18, and my personal favorite, RFC 7520, examples of protecting content using JSON object, and that ran off the bottom of the slide, damn it. Um, protecting content using JSON object encryption, <coughs> signing and encryption, or Jose. Sammy found the RFC reading to be a little bit dry. She's a little bit more practically focused. Um, but if you go through all those RFCs and, and do a little bit more background reading, you can, you'll learn that you can think of JOTS as a lightweight alternative to cookies, kind of, sort of, that you can use in a non-browser context. You can use them with mobile apps. You can use them with desktop apps. You can even use them on the command line. Um, it's also a way to do authorization or access control a little bit like OAuth, but without the desire to become a lawnmower as a profession so that you don't have to deal with OAuth. Um, and they're also cross-domain friendly, so you can use them as the basis of single sign-on style applications. They're made up of stuff that you're probably already familiar with if you've done any kind of web programming in the last few years. They're plain old JSON objects, or POJOs, that have been stringified, encoded, and cryptographically signed and then they're just transmitted over HTTP. They don't actually have to be transmitted over HTTP, but they typically are. So what does one actually look like? Well, it's a, it's a dot delimited string. It's got three parts. There's a header part, a payload part, and a signature. And you see an example down here at the bottom. This would be the header, this would be the payload, and that would be the signature. So let's look at each one of those in a little bit more detail. So the header is just a, a plain old JSON object it's base64 encoded to turn it into a string. And then it's typically, in the header, you would have metadata, such as here we have the signing algorithm, which in this case is HMAX SHA-256, and the type of token, and this is a JSON web token. There are other types. Um, I'm not gonna talk about them too much today. Then we have the payload. This is another base64 encoded POJO, and it contains what the RFC calls claims. Claims is fancy security talk for key value data pairs that you want to represent and transmit around. 
And there are three different types of keys. There are reserved keys, public keys, and private keys. The reserved keys are actually specified and spelled out in the specification. They're reserved by the specification. There's a provision for public keys, which would be something you would register with IANA. If you had a JSON web token protocol that you wanted to publicize and formalize, um, there's a way to do that. And then the most commonly used type are these private keys, which are ones you just make up. All of the reserved keys tend to be very short. So IAT is a reserved key. It stands for issued at. Remember, this: whatever is in this payload is going to get stringified. So you kind of want the keys to be as short as possible because you are going to run into some length issues if you have you know, a 300, 400 character key. Um, but this is an example of a payload. We have a name key, Linux Vest Northwest, an admin. And again, this is just a plain old JSON object. So we can put Booleans in here. We can put integers in here. I'm not an admin of Linux Vest Northwest. Um, and this is just a Unix timestamp for when this token was issued at. And then finally, we have the signature. You make the signature by taking the encoded header POJO, concatenating it with the encoded payload POJO, and then using a secret and some sort of signing hashing algorithm, such as HMAC 256, to generate the, the signature. And the signing algorithm is typically specified in the algorithm key in the header. So I'm going to show quite a bit of code in this talk. Um, and what I'm going to do in each case is I'm going to show you the whole code sample at the beginning. Nobody is going to be able to read it. Don't freak out. Uh -huh. The point of showing you the whole code sample on one slide is to show you it's not actually that much code. For any given thing that I'm going to show you, it's maybe 50 lines of code at most. After that one big slide where you're like, eh, what the? I will walk through individually. So don't freak out. Um, when I show you the first one. So this is code for making a JSON web token. That's the whole code. Um, I should also say, <coughs> in practice, if you were actually using these things in anger, you would not write any of this code. Like there are libraries for all of this stuff. But part of the talk, part of the point of the talk is to explain sort of how simple and elegant that is, the, the whole protocol is, and I think showing the code, showing how you would actually do it in code is a good way to convey that. So this is JavaScript code to make a JSON web token. Um, and we're going to start out first by defining a couple, couple of helper functions. So this is a helper function to base64 in code a JSON object, a POJO. We're going to pass that function to POJO. We're going to use the JSON library to stringify it. And then we're going to make a buffer object, give it that JSON string, convert it to base64, and return it. Right? So it does what it says on the 10. Second helper function to HMAC sign something. This takes two arguments, the string that you're trying to sign and the secret that you're going to sign it with. So we're going to use the crypto library to create an HMAC object of SHA-256, give it the secret. We're going to stick the string into it. And then we're going to ask for the digest in hex form and return it. Okay, so both two simple helper functions to just make this part easier to understand. Here's the data that we're going to be using. So we have a header, which looks very much like the header I showed you before, and a payload, which is exactly like the payload I showed you before, and then our secret. And this can just be anything. It just has to be kept secret. It's, it's right there in the name. Um, once you have all these things, here's how you generate the signature. You base64 encode the header. You base64 encode the payload. You generate the HMAC signature by taking the header, concatenating it with a dot and the payload, passing that into that HMAC function along with the secret. And then you get back that signature, and you concatenate together the header, the payload, and the signature with dots. And that gives you a JSON web token. In this case, a hand-rolled artisanal JSON web token. <laughs> if you took that JWT uh, variable that we got back and just dumped it into console log to see what it is, it looks like this. Now, I put line breaks in there after the dots just to make it easier. It actually comes out all in one line. Um, but this is a JSON web token. The key bit of this. Right? And the, the point of the whole thing, if you take nothing else away, take this away, I can give you this JSON web token, 
and make you give it back to me at some later date, and I can be sure that you didn't change anything in it. Because I have the secret that was used to generate the signature, and if you change anything in the header or the payload, it's gonna invalidate the signature. So I can give it to you, and so you have to give this back to me in five minutes in order to get lunch. And if you change anything about it, I will know. That's it, right? That's the basis of how it works. One of the things, I kind of made a little bit of fun about JWT.io earlier, but it does, has, it does have some useful uh, tools on it. And one of those tools is a validator, which you can't really see, but it's up in the header. Um, and if you go there and click that link, you end up on this validation screen where you can paste in any JSON web token you want and it'll decode it, and you, if you have the secret, it'll also let you put in the secret and validate it. When you're trying to get stuff to work initially, this is a super useful tool to have. Uh, but you can see this is, you probably can't see unless you took a picture of that previous slide, but trust me that that's the same JSON web token uh, that I had on the previous slide, and there's the data that we put into it. The other nice thing on the JWT.io site is a list of all of the libraries that the JWT people know about. And there are a lot of them. JWT has libraries for days. Um, so there are currently, or several months ago when I made this slide, there were libraries for .NET, Python, Node, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, Perl, Go, PHP, Haskell, Rust, Lua, Scala, Clojure, Objective-C, Swift, and Delphi. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you see something written in the last decade that has Delphi support, it probably has support for whatever you are using. Is anybody using Delphi? Last time I gave this talk, like one person put their hand up. Um, I don't think there's an existing COBOL implementation, although I gave this talk at scale and somebody asked about COBOL then and said they were going to go write it, so I... <laughs> You could be famous. Um, so at this point, Sammy perked back up a little bit because I kind of told her about all this stuff, explained how it worked, and we're past the RFC reading stage. So she started asking, how do I actually use JSON Web Tokens? And there are a couple of different ways because JSON Web Tokens are intentionally pretty flexible and agnostic about their use. But one way you would probably end up using them is part of a fairly standard authentication authorization workflow. So I, I stole this diagram from JWT.io. Basically, you would, on the browser side, send a post to your login endpoint with a username and password. And the server would validate that username and password and create a JWT and send that JWT back to the browser, to the client. And then on subsequent requests, the browser, the client, JavaScript, whatever, would send the JWT back. And there's a couple of different ways you can do this. The server side then validates the signature, pulls whatever information out of the JWT is in there, and then uses that to generate the response. Things that you should be aware of, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, but it is worth saying explicitly, the header and the payload are not encrypted. They are simply base64 encoded. Anybody who gets the JSON web token can debase 64 encode them and get whatever is in them. It is not the best place to put a social security number. Okay? Um, so don't send anything sensitive in the header or the payload. You need to manually handle expiration and reissue. There are uh, predefined keys. There's, we talked about IAT before. There is another uh, reserved key name called EXP that sets an expiration time for the token. You need to handle that yourself and you need to have your software be checking, hey, is this an expired token? <coughs> Some APIs that I have seen work around that issue by just sending a fresh JWT back on every request. So any token that they issue has a very short lifetime and you're gonna get a new one on the next request and they expect you to just be constantly changing the token. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, you can use this for single sign-on type stuff. You can get a JWT from one place and send it back to a second place. And as long as those two places are sharing the secret for the validation, it'll work. It, there is no sort of cookie level control on who can access this stuff, right? That's one of the good things or the bad things, depending on your point of view. Um, so I, I said you could send it different ways. 
Um, you can put it in the URL just as part of, the, of a GET request. You can send it as a key in a post body. Or one thing that a lot of people do is there is a specific HTTP header called authorization that is used for various authorization schemes. You can use the bearer scheme. And so you just have a header that says authorization bearer, and then you have the token. And then that's just transmitted as part of the HTTP request. Sammy doesn't do very well with theory. Sammy was like, how does this actually really work in an app? Like, what would you actually, how would the implementation look? So this is the code for some node code, the <coughs> server side code uh, in JavaScript for generating a token after a successful login. Again, this is not a whole lot of code, right? This is like a screen, maybe. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> screen. Um, so this is actually code from an Express app. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to generate a, a route, our user login route, and we're going to wrap the user login function. So anytime you hit user login, it'll call user login. Um, we're going to load up a library. This is a JWT library. This is a wrapper that we have at work that is a helper wrapper around a very useful library called JSON Web Token that you can get on NPM that does all of the JWTE things you need to do. Um, and here's our function. It's a standard express function, so it's going to take a request object and a response object. We're going to check and see, did we get an email and a password in the body of the request? If we did not, we're going to throw back a 400 error and tell you that you need to you know, send us an email and a password. Duh. Um, if we get by that, we're going to pull the user using this helper function that I'm not going to show you, we're going to fetch the user from the database, look them up by their email, we're going to make a claims variable, and then we're going to validate the password. Give the, the password that we were passed in the request and the password from the user object we just pulled out of the database. <coughs> Excuse me. And if those two things match, Sorry, my allergies are killing me up here. Um, if the password validates, we're then going to stick the user, <coughs> excuse me, stick the user ID in the claims object. If they don't match, we're going to send back a 401, tell you you need to authenticate to use the app, and then just bail. If we do, however, the password matches, we generate this claims object. Now we have to turn that into a JSON web token. And so that's what we're doing here using this JWT sign method, which is basically just the code I showed you in the previous slides. You're passing in that claims object and getting back a token, and then we send that back in a special X header in the response. And our client site framework knows to pull that token back out. Uh, we also send back a 200 at that point. OK, so that's how you generate one. How do you validate it? on the subsequent request. Since this is Express, you do it with a middleware. So for those of you who haven't uh, done anything with middleware, a middleware is basically a piece of code that you stick into a web application that runs on every request before the code that's actually going to process the request. So this is where you do things like making sure somebody is logged in or validating a JSON web token. And again, not a tremendous amount of code here. So first thing we're going to do is load up that same JWT library. And then this is how you define a middleware in Express. You say app.use, and then you give it a function. This is going to get a request, a response, and a next callback that you call to sort of go on to the next step in the process. We're going to initialize our, our JWT object in our request. So we're basically just making a place to put the decoded JWT. Now we're going to parse the authorization header if it exists. And we're going to use a promise here. We're going to give it the authorization header. And then we're going to have a callback that if there is an authorization header, we split it on the spaces. Zero here will be bare. So we make sure that we're looking at a bare authentication scheme. And then we verify the JWT token. We have this verification function here. We'll throw an exception if the token fails to validate. And then we re-throw that exception. Otherwise, 
if we don't have a token, we all we th we throw a different exception. And then in our um, did I skip a slide. Oh, no. So if, if we get through that without throwing an exception, the JSON web token validated, we take that decoded payload, we stick it in the JWT uh, slot, and we go on to the next step in processing the request. If we threw an error, we have this uh, error handler at the end. The one place where you can use the app without having a JSON web token is the login endpoint. If you needed a JSON web token to log in, it would be a little hard to use. So we check to see if somebody's trying to log in and using a post method, and if they are, we let that go through too. Otherwise, if we got to this point, the token either didn't validate or they're not trying to log in, and then we're gonna tell them that they need to log in. That's it. So pretty simple. Um, at this point, Sammy was happy. Sammy was like, this is awesome, I'm gonna use JWG everywhere. Um, but she was curious about what other applications you can have for JWT. And this is actually the part of using JSON Web Tokens that inspired me to write this talk. So like I said at the kind of the beginning, I don't get to write code that much because uh, I'm in management, um, but I occasionally get managed to catch a small project. And I, I caught this small project that we got for a client, which was to wrap up some proprietary code in, in a web API so that a client of theirs could use it. And I was trying to figure out, like, I really didn't want to write, you know. I feel like I've run into this problem multiple times over the life of my career. You want to put something on the internet, but you don't want everybody in the world to use it. So you, you kind of have three options. You can leave it wide open. This is the MongoDB pattern. <laughs> You can implement a full authentication and authorization system, in which case you have like user management, admin screens, and password expiration. It's a whole like, I've written this code like five times and it <laughs> sucks. Um, or you can use OAuth. Um, does anybody here like using OAuth? Well, last time I gave this talk, there were like two people in the back that put their hands up and then ran away. Um, <laughs> So where's the middle ground between like nothing and complete user management system? You can either like lock crap up like a bank vault or you can leave, you know, a completely wide open door. So where's the middle ground? I want a screen door for APIs basically, right? I want something that will keep out the flies but not necessarily stand up to a determined state level attacker because frankly Nobody cares about this API. I just need to make sure that people aren't going to like knock it over for fun. So JWT lets you do this. Um, you can do authorization without authentication, basically. You have an API. You don't want to make anybody really authenticate to use it, but you don't want it wide open. Um, so earlier, we talked about using a, a server-side secret. JWT doesn't require a server-side secret. You can use an RSA key pair as your secret. And moreover, you can include the public half. There's a specific provision in the protocol to include the public half of the key in the header of the JSON web token using a special <laughs> format called JWK, which stands for JSON web key, naturally enough. This allows the client to produce a verifiable claim. So to set up, you give your authorized client a key pair. You need to know the fingerprint of the public key. You can actually let them generate the key pair. They just need to send you the fingerprint of the public key. That's going to be important later. Then on the client side, they generate a JSON web token they use the private half of the key to sign it. They include the public half in the header. They also need to include issued at and expired times. And then they send that in with their API request. On the server side, <coughs> you pull the public key out of the header. You use that to validate the signature, right? Because it's symmetric 
cryptography, if you've got a public half and a private half, you sign it with the private half, you validate it with the public half, then you validate that you know the fingerprint of the public key, and then it's on your allowed list of key fingerprints. If you don't do that step, anybody with any RSA key pair <laughs> can generate a token that will validate. So that part is important, right? But at that point, you know the signature had to be produced with the private half because otherwise the public half wouldn't validate it. And you know that the public half that validated it is on your allowed list. So therefore, you know this is a valid JSON web token and the only people who have these are the people who get to use the API. You still then need to validate that it wasn't issued in the future. You need to validate that it follows whatever expiration rules you have set up for your API, whatever other rules you have set up for your API. You should probably try to find a library that mostly does that for you. Um, you don't want to write that three or four different times across your code base. Bad idea. Um, and again, nothing is encrypted. So your client shouldn't be using this to send their social security number to you, right? It's just a way of you being able to tell, yes, this is somebody who can use this API. So here's the client side code necessary to do that. And we're going to change things up a little bit and use Perl this time instead of JavaScript. Um, again, not a tremendous amount of code. We're going to load up uh, three libraries here at the beginning, a, a JSON web token library, a general RSA library, and an HTTP request processing library. We're going to load our public key and our private key uh, and generate crypt PK RSA objects. Um, maybe don't store your public and private key in files in the same directory as your web app. Like maybe that's not the best practice. Maybe that's just to make this code a little easier to understand. Um, and then you're going to generate a token using the encode JWT function from the JWT library. We're going to use RSA SHA-512 as the algorithm. We're going to include this extra header, this JWK header, that is the public key exported in JWK format. We're going to use the private key as the signing key. And our payload is going to be a simple issued at key with a relative expiration. This is a nice feature of the Perl library is you don't have to do that calculation yourself. You can say, this key expires in half an hour. And it will be relative to the issuing time. <coughs> and then we're going to send a request, or we're going to generate a request to send, rather, that is a post to our endpoint. We're going to include the token and the authorization header. And then we're going to put whatever uh, JSON request body we need. And that's all we need to do. The critical bit here, and I spent, this was really easy to get working. I literally wrote most of this code in like one eight hour stretch. Um, about two hours of it was figuring out how to do this. Because the JWK format is relatively new, there are a lot of older RSA libraries that don't offer it as an export option, and it has to be in that JWK format. Um, so get you one that does. Uh, and then you're fine. The Perl one is two slides back if you don't want to waste two hours on CPAN. Um, on the API side, this is the code to handle processing that request. Again, sm <coughs> small amount of code. So here we're going to get the token. And again, we're using that crypt JWK library, or JWT library rather. This time we're using the decode function rather than the encode. Again, with the RSA library. And this is code from a dancer app, which is a Perl micro framework, kind of like Sinatra, <coughs> if you're familiar with Ruby. Um, and then we're going to use Perl's exception handling library, TryTiny. We're going to pull the authorization header out. Uh, we are going to it's Perl. I'm actually required by law to have one regular expression in my code sample, or I get like drummed out of the guild. Um, so we're going to regex the header out of the authorization token. We're going to return a 401 unless we regex that, that token out. Um, and then we're going to decode it and confirm that it's valid and that it has valid issued at and expired at claims. So again, header payload here. <coughs> this decode JWT function will actually throw an exception if the token doesn't validate. So we're going to wrap that up in a try block, which is uh, kind of
coming from that Tritiny. If you are a Perl person who's not using Tritiny, you should be using Tritiny. Um, this de decode JWT here, we're giving it the token, we're asking it to decode the header, we're telling it that the only algorithm that we're going to accept is the RSA SHA-512, and we're asking it to verify the issued at and verify the expired time. So that's handling all of that other crap for us. Um, and then we don't actually bother catching the exception. If, if there's an exception thrown in this block because we declared these variables up here, those variables won't be populated. So we can say, unless we have both a header and a payload, return a 401, like we're out. They didn't authorize, they didn't authorize right. And because this is an API, it's not very user friendly. Like you literally get just a 401 with an empty body because go away. Um, if the key in the header is wrong, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. If the, key, if the JSON web token was generated using some other algorithm, it's going to fail. If it doesn't have an issued at or expiration time, it's going to fail. If it was issued in the future, it's going to fail. The uh, API actually says that you can only generate tokens that are good for an hour. So if it expires more than an hour from when it was issued, it's going to fail. And it all fails inside that decode JWT function. I didn't have to write any of that code. Um, so this is good. I like not having to write code. Yeah, and so we specify in the API docs that tokens can only be valid for one hour. We do have to check, okay, so we have to check that ourselves. I lied. Um, the library makes sure that the two exist. I actually check to make sure that the values are right in my own code. We need to make sure that this isn't some random RSA key pair. Um, so we check, we return a 401 unless the expiration time minus the issued at time is less than an hour. So there we're checking for the expiration time. And then we check to make sure that the included public key is on our whitelist, which is just stored in, uh, so we basically get that public key out of the header, out of the JWK key in the header. <coughs> we generate the fingerprint of it, or the thumbprint rather, and then we return a 401 unless that thumbprint is in our whitelist, which is just stored in the application config because there are only like two authorized users of this API. That's it. Um, if you get through those checks, you're a valid user of the API and we go on and process your request. Again, we know the public key in the header because we have its fingerprint. So we know that the private key that corresponds to that was used to sign the JWT or it wouldn't validate. And therefore, the JWT was generated by the holder of the private key who by definition is an authorized user of the API. So this is pretty simple, right? Relative to like a two Lego auth flow, hypothetically speaking. Um, this does, of course, depend on the client keeping the private key private. Again, it's right there in the, in the name. Um, but revocation, like if somebody leaks their private key, key revocation is removing them from the whitelist, right? It's pretty simple. Change a file, restart the app, you're done. There are some more advanced usages of JSON web tokens. So the, there are ways to do encrypted payloads. That's another token type. It's called JSON web encryption. Um, I'm not a cryptographer. Those RFCs made my eyes cross more than the other RFCs. Um, so I'm gonna let you research that on your own. There is also a way to do nested JSON web tokens. So you can have a JSON web token that contains another JSON web token. Oh, I'm not gonna talk about that either. Um, so, in conclusion, JSON Web Tokens solve some common problems. They solve them in what I think is a pretty elegant way, which is cool, and you should think about using them, which apparently many of you already are, so I feel like my job is done here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the people who came up with JWT and the people behind Otho.com who are the same people, uh, the organizers for accepting the talk, all of you for deciding to come to the talk. Uh, and my employer for paying to send me to this conference. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. We have a lot of time for questions, so. And I'm gonna pause for just a minute and blow my nose so that hopefully I can stop coughing like a jerk. <coughs> Yeah.
you had a question in the hoodie. Yeah. So with uh, GWT, what if uh, someone was sniffing and like took your your dot and then resubmitted it as you? So they'd be authorized as you. So if somebody, the question was, if somebody grabs your jot off the wire and then sends in a request with that jot, would they basically be you at that point? Yeah. Because it's authentic. It's a yeah. authorization, not yeah. authentication. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is a screen door, right? This is not a bank vault. The do, don't use this in financial applications, for the love of God, right? <laughs> but the, the thing that I put this in front of was a very simple API that the one client considered proprietary and that they didn't want their downstream client to directly access. They wanted it, they wanted them to run through an API. But if you get access to it for an hour, you're not going to be able to do anything, basically. So the, the risk of that happening was low. That's a, something that you definitely need to be aware of when you're doing this. Um, but yeah, if you capture the to and the best mitigation against that is short expiration times. Okay. Cool. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the <coughs> inexpress and JSON web server can only work with the post request, right? Um, no. Or You're wrong. <laughs> 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 Sorry. That was a cheap shot. I tried using it with like um, I don't know. So the question is whether JSON Web Tokens work with non-post requests in Express. Um, and I can tell you that there's nothing in the way that JSON Web Token protocol is specified that requires it to be used in the post. Um, I don't know if there's something about a particular Express middleware that may be making that assumption. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't, you know, how, so how were you sending the token? Were you sending it in the body of the request or as a header? Yeah, so if you're sending in the header of the HTTP request, you should be able to get access, to, unless there's some aspect of Express that I don't know off the top of my head that it handles put and delete requests differently and doesn't run them through the middleware chain, but that would shock me, frankly. You, you, you're welcome to find me. <laughs> Any other questions? It's not stored as a cookie. Um, you can store it in local storage. At that point, you're opening yourself up more to that mm -hmm. issue. So the, the question is about where you store the JSON web token. Um, you, you can store it in local storage. At that point, you open yourself up to token uh, capture, right? possibly by somebody else. Um, what we've done in the times that we've implemented it, we're using uh, like a single page app uh, you know, client-side JavaScript application is just stored in the memory of the application. We don't write it. We don't, you know, persist it. Did that answer your question? But, but if it really was like a screen door with wide open screen, you could store it. In the, 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 so for the screen door, um, <laughs> the screen door implement, uh, implementation, right, you're not actually generating the token the, the token doesn't need to be stored. The client's generating the token and sending it in with the request. With the, the workflow I talked about at first, that's just a standard kind of login-based workflow, right? You send in your username and password, you get back a token, and then you send that token in on subsequent requests. And so that token is, is vaguely cookie-like, but it's not stored in the cookie store. It, it doesn't have to be persisted at all other than in the process, right? To just be able to send it back. The screen door implementation, the client's generating the JSON web token, the server's validating it, and that's it. Like the token doesn't need to be stored at all. The, the API that we actually implemented, you have to send in a JSON web token on every request. There's no, there's no state or, around being authenticated, right? You're always generating a token, sending it in. Who's giving it the green light after yeah, yeah, and that API 
like there's literally one endpoint. Like you, you send in a bunch of data and you get back an answer. Um, yeah, in the back. So I had an example where the client had a secret. Where does that secret come from? I don't think I had an example where the client had a secret. Oh, sorry, I mean the, uh, the client is generating the token. The client generating the token, that's actually using the RSA uh, public-private key pair. So they have both halves of that key pair. The only thing I have, or the only thing I need to have, is the fingerprint of the public half. And how do you get that? They send it to you. They send it, you set that up GitLab. in advance. But your code was generating the RSA key in the client side, so you have to No, get it, it wasn't that, it wasn't right? generating oh, it. It, it was, was just it was just a file. It was just reading, reading it in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna e light over the fact that it So uh, that's you know, kinda like his question then. If it is stored on disk, then the private key part of it. We're we're side. gonna e light over the fact that the example I showed <laughs> is storing keys on disk, right? That is not a best practice. You should have some sort of vault technology where like you're you know don't do it like that. You but you do have to you know, if you're generating this token, yeah, you have to read the key in the memory at some point to, to be able to sign it. But again, that's all happening on the <laughs> client side. Yeah. Uh, do you have any comments on Um, I do I have any comments on using it? Uh, so using SAML with Jots? No, no, no. I'm saying in the replacement for SAML. Okay. Um, I, I haven't seen any. I have. I have no personal experience with single sign-on using JSON Web Tokens. That said, I do have experience with using SAML too. I would do damn near anything to not use SAML 2. <laughs> um, the only reason I make fun of OAuth and not SAML is because more people know what OAuth is. But yes, like I, I'm actually, internally I'm screaming and running in the opposite direction right now because SAML is horrible. Um, well, so. It's older XML based, right? Yeah. It's, it's enterprise and XML, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and security. It's it, it, yeah, it's 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 one of the few things out there. Um, but I, I would hope that something JSON Web Token based comes in to replace that because oh, SAML is just you. like freaking horrible. But I haven't I haven't personally had to do anything in that area, so I don't have. Sorry. Question? Yeah. So I'm curious about uh, performance wise. If you wanted to set it up, and rather than doing an expiration token, you wanted to chain single use tokens per request. Would the performance be prohibitive to that, or is that something that would be reasonable for like an API? Would the performance be prohibitive if you were generating a fresh JSON web token on every request? I don't know. Okay. Sorry, I haven't looked at that at all. I don't think it would be horrible, but um, it, that's any any. I'm in IT consulting, right? So anytime you ask me a question about performance, my answer is it depends. So. <laughs> Yeah. Is there anything nascent on the horizon for SAML replacement that you are sniffing around? Is there anything on the horizon for SAML replacement? Uh, God, I hope so, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I, we've done three or four different jobs where I ended up being involved in SAML implementations, and I hope that I'm high enough up in the company now that if that work came along again, that I could price us so that we wouldn't win it. <laughs> like it's that it's that bad. Um, what specific problems have you run into that, that make you cringe like that? It just never works. It, it it literally never works the first time, and organizations that tend to implement it tend to have very stratified IT departments, and so the people that you have to talk to to get it to work don't want to talk to you because you're not from the company. So then you end up with the people who hired you trying to mediate the interaction with their IT, and they don't know anything, which is why they hired me. <laughs> it's just never a good time. And it, it literally, like, I don't think we've ever done an implementation that didn't involve the final working being like three hours on a conference call with us trying something and them saying, no, it doesn't work yet. 
maybe we're just really bad at SAML. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> like, I, it, do you like SAML? Because you would be the first person no, I have ever met. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't say that I care for it. I just it's ubiquitous. It's becoming seen in a lot of places. Yeah, um, I, I think it's becoming ubiquitous because there's no no other alternative. I just got too unlucky. It, it sh maybe I got really unlucky. I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I could say something nice about it, but I can't. Yeah. Would you consider uh, once you validated the uh, the token, if you were expecting to reuse it for a period of time, would you consider cashing that or as a valid token, or would you consider would you Would I cash token validation? Um, honestly, I would have to sit down and, and really think about, like, so I don't, I can't think of any reason. One, I've never thought about it. Two, I can't think of any reason off the top of my head why it would be problematic. But three, this is security related stuff and, and going with the <laughs> off the top of my head answer is usually how you get in trouble. So I would want to sit down and like really carefully think through it and maybe talk to, you know, people I work with or, or friends who are nastier minded than me um, to, and think about because I, 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 I will be perfectly frank. I'm not a super security person. I'm not good at thinking about ways to screw stuff up. Um, so I would want to run that by some people. But my gut says that it would probably be okay but i it also feels like a little bit of a like the validation doesn't take that long um it feels a little premature optimization -y too is there what what's your cons like why would you want to do that oh it's just for for a request that you would you know not the one-time api right I haven't really sat down and like spec'd out how long it takes to do the validation, but I suspect it's one of those things where it's fast enough that, like, with a lot of um, with a lot of this kind of stuff, optimizing that stuff is pointless because like it's going to be completely swamped by network latency. Like, you're not going you can make it a hundred times faster and nobody's going to care because it the request just takes like half a second all by itself. But again, I, I don't know. That's another one of those you'd have to actually measure things. Any other questions? All right, thanks for coming. Yeah.